I know you've been touring after a long time of not touring with the group. So the first thing I would like to ask to start the conversation is, how is it going? How is it like to be with the readers again and to meet? Uh, I mean, people have expectations, you have expectations. How is your book, Amigo Imaginario, treating you so far? So far, it's been fantastic. The, the crowds have been wonderful, very receptive. I think people, I wasn't, I, I didn't know um, that so many people would be so excited that I have another book after all these years, you know, <laughs> it is very gratifying, not wow. only in terms of the number of people, the number of people that have shown up to all the events, but the passion with, with which um, they've just shared their experiences in terms of what uh, the Perks of Being a Wallflower has meant to them. And um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a wonderful tour so far. You know, we had basically have hundreds of people everywhere I go. And it's, it's very, very, uh, it's very gratifying. You know, and, yeah. and some, so, some, some people are very surprised that I wrote something scary. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Francisca from Chile. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. So I had this question because uh, the perks of being a wallflower, your first novel, it's a really beloved novel for many of us. And it took 20 years for you to deliver us another novel and it's so different novel mm -hmm. so um as a writer myself i was wondering um how do you handle the pressure you know of knowing that everyone's eyes are on your book right now ready to <laughs> love it or hate it ready to thank you or blame you for all, <laughs> all these years of waiting i mean it's, it's hard it's, it's really hard so um how do you feel about it well i feel i feel very very excited. I would say equal parts uh, excited and afraid because, um, you know, because it is a slight departure, certainly in terms of the genre. But I also feel that that um, it's, it's a fiercely personal book to me. And I know that maybe because of some of the subjects, it doesn't feel like that. But I'm writing a lot about my childhood growing up in Western Pennsylvania. I'm writing about um, some of the questions that I had growing up and being raised Catholic um uh in western pennsylvania and so so yeah in a lot of ways it's as personal to me as the perks of being a wallflower was so yeah so i'm excited i'm excited to show this side of myself and at the same time i'm afraid because i know that uh whenever you deal with spiritual matters even if it's mm -hmm. done in a thriller even if it's done in a supernatural kind of way um you know some people are going to bristle and uh and so <laughs> I, i'm ready for that <laughs> <laughs> you are? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> yes. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Hi, Mabel from Mexico. I was wondering if you consider that uh, something important in your writing is to talk about the tragedies in everyday life. Like in, in the parks, you also talk about like uh, a coming of age story, the difficulties of being a teenager. You talk about abuse. I think there's something about that also in this, in this novel. How did you... Uh, take this decision of enrich all these tragedies in everyday life with fantasy and horror and some um, uh, Bible references? Well, how I did it was I, I looked at how, how everyday fears or everyday tragedies or traumas and the fear that they caused and how they can relate to supernatural fears. What was interesting to me is looking at all the different um, things that scare us whether it's 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 you know something as uh, as universal as a grim fairy tale and there are mm -hmm. allusions to grim something as fairly universal as some of the religious uh, you know and spiritual um, uh, issues that were that were raised with as children and you know when I was a kid I was just as afraid of Grimm's fairy tales as mm -hmm. I was of the idea of damnation and <laughs> so so I looked at those. I looked at those subjects and I compared them with um, a lot of the things that people face that cause fear, whether some abuse happened and so that could lead someone to be afraid of being touched or being hit again. Or, and, and I'm very interested, and, and this goes from The Perks of Being a Wallflower, all of my movies, and now with, with Imaginary Friend, I'm very interested in, in the fears that people keep inside them that they carry with them as they go through life. And I want my work to be part of the healing of those fears and so people can be less afraid. That's so beautiful. I wanted to know 
how did you felt when you decided you wanted to write this new book? Like, were you afraid? Did you have the idea before you were roaming it for a long time? How was like the writing of that first line? Uh, the writing of the first line was was a great deal of fun. Well, I'll I'll tell you in two parts. The genesis of the book was I just had the idea that we all the experience that we all had as children, where you lay in the grass, you look up in the sky, and you'd see the clouds. We all have that experience, and um, and you'd say, oh, that looks like a dog, a hammer, a face, whatever it was. And so my original idea was, what would happen if a little boy looked up in the sky and realized that for the last two weeks, it was always the same face looking back at him. Mm. And I didn't, when I thought of that, I thought it was an interesting, uh, but I didn't know what it, what it meant. And I just thought of that moment outside of his school when he's waiting for the last, or the last of the school buses go away and he's waiting for his mom to pick him up. And he's standing there and he's reading his book. And then the shadow cuts across the page and he looks up and the sky that was like maybe this big is now almost as big, the face is almost as big as the sky. And I thought of that moment when Christopher looks up at the cloud and says, hello, can you hear me? And there's the thunderclap that could be a coincidence. So he says, if you can hear me, blink your left eye. And I thought of the cloud going like this yeah. and then floating away. And I became obsessed with this idea. I didn't know what the cloud meant. I didn't, I didn't know who the friend was. I thought of the title at the, around the same time. I didn't know who the friend was. I didn't know uh, that it would lead me on something of a spiritual, supernatural journey. Um, but I just followed the cloud. Uh, which I think a lot of us do in our, our lives in, in metaphoric ways. So writing the first line when, when it says, you know, don't leave the street, they can't get you if you don't leave the street. The line came very quickly. And the idea of the street that was our salvation came quickly. And so many of those images, the idea, I'm writing about the same neighborhood that I had in the, in the Perks of Being a Wallflower. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, and, you know, in Perks of Being a Wallflower, I wrote about the daytime and imaginary friend I wrote about night, you know, where you, uh, the dark streets and the woods and the deer, and it was all those things that I was raised with, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that was where it came from. And I remember, and I also love the idea just as a, as a parent, now I have two children and I think about things differently. I think more as a parent and of all the characters, I relate to Kate Reese the most, uh, the mom. Mm -hmm. And and I remember, however, though, my memory of being a little boy and, and all children want to protect their parents and <laughs> most children are too small to do it. And I thought how wonderful it would be to give a child a power so he could protect his mother. And about, about that, the relationship between Christopher and his mother is so beautiful and so Thank powerful. You. It really hit me. Did you inspire in your own life or someone else's? It was inspired. I dedicated the book. I said it was for Liz and mothers everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Liz is my wife. She's the mother oh. of, of, of our two children. And, um, and so she was my inspiration for Kate Reese. Oh. Uh, my, mm -hmm. my wife had a very uh, difficult upbringing and she's the strongest person that I know personally. And, um, and I, I basically, I saw her, I saw her, what she, how having children changed her in so many ways, in very, very profound ways. And it's something that even though I love my children and I'm a very devoted father, I noticed that, that, my, uh, that the change in her was so much more profound than the change in me. It has to be biological, I would imagine, because mm -hmm. um, I'm a pretty sensitive person and I love my kids. But just watching her change, watching her do anything for them, um, the need to protect is it's it's very awe inspiring to witness. So yeah, that that's where it came from. And of course, I related to some of it, and I wrote about some of my own experiences of being a father through Kate Reese's um, uh, devotion to Christopher. But it was really for Liz, and Christopher was really came from me. This book is about relationship relationships, Christopher yeah. and her mother, but also uh, her his friends. I think there are. A great team, they support in Christopher in all his adventures. I want to know if you inspired in at the same time in another story for having Christopher or to have Christopher this uh, group of friends. Well, yeah, the group of friends came from just memories again of growing up. Um, 
especially the character of Special Ed. That's what I call him in, uh, I, I'm not sure what he is in Spanish. Um, I remember there's a boy up the, up the road um, I grew up with uh, named Eric Olson. He was a very, very good friend of mine when I was a, you know, three, four, five years old. And I remember Eric used to be late to the bus sometimes and he would bring bacon on the bus to eat on the school bus. And I always thought that was so funny. <laughs> so I, 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 from that image, I thought of the character name of Special Ed, which is a pun here in, in, in English. Um, it means special education. That's what we call it, so it's Special Ed. Oh. And um, mm -hmm. so that's where the name right. came from. And, uh, and then I just started thinking about him and what his parents must be like. And I, I don't know, I really enjoyed that. And then the M&Ms, I liked the fact that, that uh, they were twins. I thought that was really interesting. And I love the idea of like a gang of boys, like these four boys. I, I, was, very, uh, I was very taken by that because I had a group growing up that I loved and they all moved away um, over the years. It's ironic, actually, I can share this with you. Uh, you know, it, it, we can all think back to our childhood friends and maybe you get the best friend in grade school. Uh, the first 12 best friends I ever had in my life, they all moved away. Um, and, um, and so I lost my first 12 best friends over time and, uh, and they, they kept moving away. And so in a lot of ways, imaginary friend was, was my attempt to rekindle some of those friendships that I lost along the way of childhood. I have a couple of questions. The first one is, how would you describe your new book in three words? And the second oh. question is, um, was it hard uh, to make the readers, well, do you think it's going to be hard for them to make them scared, like when they mm -hmm. are reading the book? Mm -hmm. Well, I would describe it with three words. Here are my three words. Okay. Um, heart and horror. Is that that's what this book is. In, in terms of in terms of the fear, um, you know, so far I, it hasn't been difficult. People people have been very afraid of the book in I think a very good way. Um, some people uh, respond, uh, you know, and there are two types of horror in the book. Some of it is very subtle and it's based more in the real world, and some of it's based in the imaginary world. Mm -hmm. And and it, what's been interesting is is to watch the different the different reactions. Some people find the real far more terrifying and some people find the imaginary more, more, more uh, fearful. Yeah. So it, it's, it's very interesting. It's like almost like a Rorschach test. Um, I will say this, uh, probably I've heard more than anything else, the part in the book where uh, Christopher's, uh, where, the, where the children's program, Bad Cat, when, when the Saturday morning cartoon program stops its episode, turns to the camera and says, oh, hi, Christopher, are you enjoying the show? <laughs> Pretty much across the board, everyone is afraid of that scene. Yeah. The television talking back to Christopher. I, I don't know <laughs> if you read what people have, well, reviews that are out there, but um, in The Guardian, Alison Flood said that Imaginary Friend was like an homage to Stephen King. And I would like to know if that's true, if you had him as your influence, uh, as an influence while you were writing and you were talking about the Green Brothers before. I don't know if they were also kind of a reference and influence and which other um, terror authors would you consider influences in this novel? Well, yeah, well, Stephen King, he's my favorite writer of all time. And, <laughs> uh, and it really ever since I was about 12 years old. So yes. Uh, uh, it is a, it is a complete homage to him, and and almost like a love. It's almost like a fan letter to him. Um, mm. He's even in the acknowledgments of my book. I said in my book uh, where I, I thanked Emma Watson for inspiring the ending on the set of The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and I and I thank for inspiring everything else. So yes, absolutely. I think he's a genius, and uh, and I can't say enough good. I, I wish he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if he will, but I wish he would. Um, there are many, there are many, uh, you know, Grimm, of course, the fairy tales, they scared me. Um, and also a lot of, you know, I, I, I am a filmmaker in a lot of movies, whether it's John Carpenter's Halloween or it's The Exorcist or The Omen or uh, uh, Hitchcock's Psycho or uh, The Sixth Sense, M. Night Shyamalan's movie, I thought was fantastic. And Stanley Kubrick's The Shining which I also pay tribute to in my book. I, I keep referencing 217 in the book. 
Um, and that is both a tribute to The Shining book, where they stay in room 217, and it's also a reference to The Shining movie, which where mm -hmm. they stay in room 237. So that's a little, uh, that's a little wink to the horror crowd. Um, I also love Peter Straub. I think Joe Hill is fantastic. I loved his book, The Fireman. And uh, trying to think of any other classics that I'm missing. That's pretty much it. That's the, 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 that, that group. Will you say that when you're writing horror, you write about things that scare you or about things that will scare others? I think a little bit of both. I think that, uh, you know, human beings have a lot of common fears. And whether it's a fear of something that can come and get them or kill them or, or hurt them, or it's a fear that we all have where that voice in our head says, maybe you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you don't look nice enough or you weigh too much or this, that, or the other. We all fight that voice. And one of the, one of the interesting things I was able to explore in Imaginary Friend is the idea of whether or not that voice is real or it's somebody else. Like, is that you saying all those terrible things to you or is it something else? Well, um, there's like a quote in the back of the Spanish books that said, um, we can either swallow our fear or let us devour, yeah, let it devour us. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, was there a time while you were writing this book um, when you were afraid you wouldn't be able to pull it off or, or that the public yes. wouldn't like it as much as the Berks? The fear of not pulling and because, because especially if you've gotten to the end, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of things and, and I'm dealing with a, um, you know, things that I also know are very important to people. And I'm, I'm trying to be very respectful of everybody's viewpoints about the subject. So it, it was very interesting and, and somewhat scary. I was worried about not pulling it off. I knew it was a long book, but I wanted it to, to be a, a readable book. I knew that it was dealing with big subjects, but I wanted them to be relatable. And I knew that I was dealing with issues that could be very polarizing, but I wanted to be respectful of both sides. So yeah, I, I, pulling it off was my fear. In terms of whether or not, listen, in terms of people liking it as much of, as The Perks of Being a Wallflower or mm -hmm. more, I know some people will like it more because they're, they're more inclined to read horror than they are coming of age. Um, and you know, some people will like The Perks of Being a Wallflower more because it meant so much to them when they were younger or they like coming of age better than horror. Um, at the end of the day, if, if I am now 49 years old and the idea that 20 years after I wrote a book um, that people still care about it and still buy it and still talk about it and still cherish it is, is such an honor that, you know, if, if 30 years from now, I hope I have a very long life. If at, the end, if at the end of my life, the only thing that is worth putting in my obituary is the perks of being a wallflower, I'll be fine with that. What about wonder? Get out of here. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I love Wonder and I love <laughs> the Beast and I love doing Rent and I love doing Jericho and I love Imaginary Friends. So yeah, I'm very proud of what I've been able to do. It's more of, it's more of, uh, listen, you know, I know this is a departure and so far people have been very excited about it, you know. Um, you know, I think it's, it's made a, you know, a couple of Catholics mad. <laughs> I, I'm one of them, so I, I know what I was trying to say, but you know, <laughs> and some of them get it and some of them don't. Anyway, but um, I know, I know that, uh, you know, I, I knew I was taking a chance with this, but I'm really excited that I took it, you know, and, uh, and it's really, really been very gratifying when people come up to you and they say that it's one of the best horror, mo uh, best horror books they've ever read or they've read in 10 years, you know, and just, and maybe the next person in line is saying like, what did you mean by this? And, and I say, so I said, well, and, and both can be true, you know, and it's, it's fine with me if, 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 it, if it, you know, I just, I'm a nice person, so I don't like people to be offended or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, so far, the, the, I think the res response has been mostly very, very positive. Did you enjoy writing horror? It was a good genre for you? I loved it. Loved it. Because... All those scenes, you know, I'm, I'm, because of all my training in the movies, my brain thinks very cinematically. Mm. So even when I'm writing prose, I'm feeling very, um, even when I'm writing prose, I, I just, I see it as pictures. I always have. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was very freeing to write something that could exist so much in sound and in imagery and in, in some cases repetition. You know, I want to say one thing about, um, about the prose. Uh, style, and I don't know if this is useful to, to for your purposes, but I want to share it. 
-huh. The book is written, I'm not sure about the translation that was done, um, but the, I wrote the book, I wrote the book uh, almost from a child's point of view. Mm -hmm. yep. In the sense that if you read it and you say, wow, the sheriff is known as the sheriff pretty much the entire uh, book. And the teachers are known by their proper names, um, you know, yes. uh, like Senora Henderson or, or uh, you know, even saying Christopher's mother. Uh, I say that a great deal. And the reason it is because that is how children see the world. And I love, uh, what I love to do is, is establish that tone or establish that point of view and be consistent with it. That's also why, if you notice, there's so much repetition of language. Mm -hmm. The reason why there's yeah. so much repetition of language is that is how children are taught fairy tales, number one. That is how all religious training happens when you're young. And that repetition becomes indoctrination. The repetition itself becomes almost an incantation that we say almost automatically. I can, I can be half asleep and recite the Lord's Prayer. And, and so I thought about that as a style for, for telling a book, but then also as a style for telling a horror book. I thought it was, I don't know, I thought it was, I made that choice. And, and so far people, I think I've caught on to it. It's really gratifying because it's not an obvious choice to make. We were talking about fear and I would like to know which one do you think it's harder, writing horror or showing it on screen? Mm. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> because for me, I think writing it, it's more difficult because you have to make things happen inside everyone's mm. without, without showing everything, just with letters and lines. Well, you know, I, I am going to make the movie of this someday. Mm. So maybe <laughs> I can answer that question a lot better in <laughs> five years. Okay. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> I will say, may, I, you know what, I, I think I'll probably say that it's harder to write it in a book. And the reason is because you have to show the internally and externally. In a movie, it's pretty much exclusively external. It's very difficult to show the things that scare people inside of themselves yeah. uh, in such a literal medium as film or television. So yeah, I'd say mm -hmm. probably books because it has, to, it has to work on both levels. It has to be frightening in terms of the scene and then it has to also uh, serve all, all the characters' fears inside of their hearts or their souls. I'm sorry, I, I also talk too much. <laughs> Not <But> at all. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, you said beautiful things about your wife before and there's something that I think happens in, your, in the perks and, and here that is the way you write about women and the things that happen to them. I think it's really uh, important um, to give voice to these uh, difficulties that sometimes happen because of gender. So is that like a personal choice or do you have it like in your genes or, or how is that uh, something important for you to translate in your work? Uh, that's a very nice question, thank you. Uh, yes, it is very, very personal to me. Um, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you exactly why uh, that I relate so deeply um, to what I believe at least uh, women experience. I have many friends that have had difficult times in their lives and I care about them very much. I was raised um, in a household where my mom and dad were very much equal to each other. And, and I was taught, you know, Pittsburgh where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania, it's a really cool town in the sense that you're taught to respect everyone where they are. Meaning, if you're writing about children, you don't talk down to a child. You, you look at it, you, you get on your knee and you see the child eye level. Mm. If you're speaking to a woman, you speak with the same kind of respect of equality. Nobody is better than anybody else. You know, you might have more money, you might have more power, you might be older, you might have, who knows, whatever it is, but that doesn't make you an inherently better person. And so I was raised to believe that, and I believe it with all of my heart and soul. I also feel that, that uh, you know, I love writing about women because I feel that, um, I don't know, I just, I relate, I, I very, very much relate to, uh, I guess, God, how do I say this in the right way? Um, <laughs> Just say it. That sounds good. <laughs> no, I, you know, I just, re I relate to women in a very profound, I just relate to women in a very profound way. Some of the things that I've gone through in my life are, are so similar 
to what uh, women I've known, dear friends and my wife and, and other people have gone through. And I just feel like I somehow get it. Um, maybe I don't get all of it. Um, and maybe I see it in a lens because I am, I am a man. I, I, you know, I'm a straight man. And, um, but, but for, so I'm sure there are some limitations that I'm not aware of, but there's just a feeling like when I'm writing about Mary Catherine McNeil and I'm thinking about her as this young woman who, who believes, who believes uh, what she has been taught so much. And she's such a good young woman and that her thinking of what if I sin and before I'm able to go to confession, I die and I'm so afraid of being damned and how people internalize that, how people can blame themselves for the things they've been through, or they've been through, or how people can take on uh, an almost impossible expectation of, of a life. I really relate to that. And I may not, I may not have had all the same experience that Mary Catherine had, but, but I have a lot of them. So there's that. Or with Kate Reese, I see what my wife goes through. And because I'm something of an empath, I have a great deal of empathy for what she, she experiences because I believe in her so deeply that when I write about her, um, I write with a sense of longing because we all know what it's like to love someone. And I'm sure everyone on, on, on our line right now knows if you could just you know, give them everything that you think they deserve, right? And so I can't do that. I don't have a magic wand. I don't have a magic pill that's going to take away certain doubts or certain pain or some, some painful experience in the past. I can't do that. But what I can do is write about a character and throw all the passion that I want for the women in my life uh, uh, to, to overcome experience or, or feel. Um, and then, you know, I also have a great deal of sympathy as you know, notice in the book, there are quite a few elderly characters, man, men and women. And just like I don't exactly know what it's like to be 85 years old, I do know what it's like to have my grandmother be 91 and not remember who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. And to write about that in a way, um, and, you know, almost with Christopher, to wish that I had the power to touch her and to have her remember everything about her life and to come back to us, you know? So yeah, I... I it's, I probably didn't answer your question the right way, um, but those are all the things that I feel and I do it all the time. You know, I just, I, what I want, I want freedom for all people and I want all people to be able to live happy, good lives. And, and because I respect all people fundamentally the same, um, you know, in this case, they, they happen to be women and, and I'm glad that you feel like I've done a good job of it. Um, can you explain a bit your writing process? Because I wish to be a horror author one day. So maybe you could inspire me a bit. Tell me about sure. your writing process. Well, well, over the years, uh, I'm older now, but over the years, I have collected a, a document that I call napkin notes. Okay. I used to write on napkins and now I type it. And my process with Imaginary Friend, I, th I thought of that original idea, but then I thought of something else. I was looking over, uh, I went to my napkin notes, this document is like 12,000 pages long. And every idea, line, character, image, what I do is I, I write it down and then I, I label it. So let's say this is an idea. And then I just say horror, crime, noir, uh, line, funny, whatever. I, I categorize it. And then when I'm starting a, a, a work, what I'll do is I'll go through it and I'll look at everything that I said it had horror elements or childhood or memory or whatever it is. And then I have a massive notes document in the case of imaginary friend. When I started, I think it was 179 pages long. Wow. So I already had 179 pages of just random ideas and images. And what I looked for was how they all related to each other. Cause subconsciously I've been working on this book for three decades. I didn't know it, but I was. Oh. And so I, take those ideas and I string the, the, the ones together that belong and they lead to other ideas and they lead to other themes and characters. And it just becomes a, a really fun game of, I don't know, it, it's almost like a free association or like an improv. Um, that's how I do it. So when I write, I just don't worry about it and I just kind of let it go and, and I let it be interesting and whatever. And then by the end, by the end of the book, uh, once I'm done to the end, then I really revise and I make sure it all holds together. 
so I'll also say this to you as a, as a young writer, is that um, just to not convince, the, uh, there's a lie. The lie is uh, writer's block. I do not believe that writer's block exists. What I believe about writer's block is when it happens, you're just trying to edit too fast, okay? You're mm. trying to judge what you're writing before you actually wrote it. And it, it makes people afraid. They can't mm -hmm. get it out. Just write it. Don't worry about it. Let tomorrow tell you if today's any good. You know, mm. that's the best thing. And if you always have that system, then today is always free, you know? So do that. Stephen, what was more difficult to write? The imaginary world or the real world? Imaginary. Much harder. The real world's very easy for me to write about. You know, um, you know the, uh, all the characters and, and the things that they face in their lives and the feelings that they have about their lives. That was, that was very, very easy. So if you found like an emotional part of the story or, or like when Ambrose remembers his, his late wife or when Kate Reese remembers her late husband or some of the things that the characters are facing, some of the children, so easy. Um, once I went over to the other side, that was far more difficult. You know, because it's all, it's a, it's, it's a literal uh, other world that I'm trying to understand for myself and I hope for the readers. So, yeah, yeah. it's a great question. No one's, that's, that's Thank pretty, you. I just, I just want no. to say one thing. No. Since I started to read a book, I have nightmares every <laughs> oh night. <my> yeah, <laughs> oh, really. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, this is for me like a must ask question. Um, did you have an imaginary friend growing up? <laughs> Well, I'm going to say this. Uh, I'm going to say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a yes. Like a yes. Yeah, that, that's definitely. the only question I'm not going to answer. That's the only one. <laughs> I'll answer them all. Not that one. But did you have, I don't know, conversations with people that had imaginary friends growing up? Yes. At least? Yeah. Yes, I did. Okay. You know. And... <laughs> You know, let me ask you, is everybody on, on, on this, uh, did everybody read, read the whole book? Is everyone done? Yes. That's okay. Well, do you, well I don't want to give away the, I don't want to give away the twist. <laughs> I don't want spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> I can't spoil it for everyone else. But, you know, anyway, everybody else knows what I'm talking about. Um, I thought, you know, uh, here I have uh, probably the single greatest single line pitch for a book I will ever have, and I can't use it, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, or how do you create a good feeling or a good like um, I don't know challenge maybe for a character when you're talking about terror like right now we have like so many authors that have written terror before it's so cinematic as you were saying like we have all these uh, amazing filmmakers here in Mexico there's Guillermo del Toro that that like uh, create monsters and, oh God, and yeah. the new generations are harder to scare maybe so how do you create a great villain that makes you want to stick uh, throughout the book and throughout the adventure well, I, I, I hope how I would approach it is how I approach every character. The idea that, that to, to approach a villain almost as if he or she uh, views themselves, which is the hero of the story, you know. Mm. Um, to me, the most frightening thing is when someone does horrible, horrible things in what they think is good for good reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, in history, in history, um, that has led to some of the biggest horrors the world has ever known. People that felt completely justified in their horrific actions or their horrific speech. So, so yeah, that's how, that's how I do it, you know? And also looking again at the, that the things that uh, unite us all as people, you know, we all, uh, we all have fear for our children. We all have fear for uh, our parents. If we are children, we all have, you know, the idea that, you can turn a Saturday morning cartoon into a menacing scene, or you can be out in the woods and you don't know what's out there. And uh, you, you begin to, you know, you find things hidden out into the woods. I think these are all images that, that, that will stay with us and that we can all relate to on some level. So I think that's how you do it. In terms of the villain, again, if the villain feels justified in what he or she is doing and can even on some level coax the reader into believing that this is a really good idea for, you know, for, uh, for a time being. Um, well, I don't know anything that's more frightening than that. Um, well, I was reading the blurb Emma Watson wrote for you, which is amazing, by the way. Um, she didn't only say um, 
this book was a masterpiece, but that it was like both a spiritual enlightenment book and a horror book. How can you accomplish both? <laughs> well, I, I feel that, that that is what I set out to accomplish. It was looking at, okay, so I'm trying to, as an author, I'm trying to look at the entire scope of all the things that frighten kids, okay? And whether it's, like I said, grim fairy tales, and we all know the woods, and you know, here's Christopher, and he has a little red riding, he has a red hoodie as he goes, in, just like Little Red Riding Hood. So, you know, Hansel and Gretel, the witch becomes the hissing lady. So all of these things, these primal fears, so I'm doing that, and at the same time, I'm talking about some of the, I guess, some of the religious fears I was taught as, as uh, some of the, uh, someone has a dog um, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, <laughs> well done. Some of the things that I, I was raised to fear when I was young. So to me, I was looking at everything that might, might crawl into a child's imagination and take root. You know, even the idea of this, I mean, the idea of a, of a little boy picking up a white plastic bag in the woods and begin to talk to it as if it's a friend. Even that, that whole idea of how often do we worry for our children that they might have some kind of a mental illness or something that we can't get at. You know, we all wanna protect our kids, but what if you can't see the thing that's threatening them? What if you can't find it? You know, so yeah, all those, that's how I did it. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for uh, you know, your interest, but also, I, it means so much to me as as someone you know I love. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to me that that my book is is going all through uh, expanding world like this. You know, it's such a beautiful language, and I'm very very honored that my my book is in it.